All right, welcome to today's episode of the Australian Lawn and Garden Podcast. It's the first one I'm recording for 2024. I feel like an old man already. But we've got a good one for you. We've got Cam. Uh, he's from Organic Garden Patch. And a few of you will be following him because he's got quite a few followers there, Cam. You're doing pretty good on the Instagrams. Why don't you introduce yourself? Let us know who you are, mate. And uh, let's talk about all things lawn and garden because that's pretty much all your hobbies, isn't it? Tied up into one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, g'day, guys. Um, appreciate having me on the pod- podcast today. I'm um, looking forward to having a bit of a casual chat. So, my name's Cameron. Um, I'm a bit of a, a different guy, I think. Um, I've got quite a range of different hobbies. Um, obviously, lawn and garden is probably one of the main ones that uh, I have on a day-to-day basis. Um, for work, I work in transport. So, I'm in the I want to call it the agricultural industry. A big part of our work is uh, working alongside farmers, dairy producers, etc. So um, we've got quite a number of trucks that we we run throughout the country, which is pretty interesting. And so, how did you get? So you're doing transport, which is obviously, yeah. I mean, transport kind of technically relates to everything. You know what I mean? Like at some point, you're gonna yeah. have to move something. But in reality, it's it's a world apart from actual gardening. How did you get into this? Because I'll, I'll set the scene for you a little bit. If people have never heard of you, jump on Organic Garden Patch on Instagram because I was saying to this, you to this, uh, saying this to you before is I think you're kind of what a lot of people or what you're doing is what a lot of people want to do. You've got a green lawn. You've got a veggie patch. It doesn't seem overly complicated. There's some pretty good stuff that you get out of it. You got some nice photos of beautiful tomatoes and zucchinis and videos and stuff. And you got two dogs, so you're doing something right. And I think a lot of people go, they might look at someone who's real nerdy and really appreciate the knowledge and love learning from it, but ultimately it's not as relatable. And that's why I wanted to get you on because you are you're not a full time gardener. You're not somebody who's done a fifteen thousand year career who's found out the secret elixir to the meaning of the existence of the cell itself. It's just, you know, we're just talking about what do you do growing zucchinis and all that sort of stuff. So that's why I wanted to get you on. And um, yeah, anyways, where were we going with that? I don't even know. The, what, what came to mind as I was talking to you about that? What was well, that? I definitely agree. There's, there's a massive difference between um, transport and gardening, I think you know, partially the gardening side of it is a bit of an escape that we, mm-hmm. you know, you, you're working 40, 45 hours a week, um, dealing with some pretty unpleasant characters at time and, you know, using the garden as a, a mechanism of almost recovery for the next week has been fantastic. Yeah. Transport, do you know, I had a guy today, I'm at the warehouse for those who are listening and um, I was having my lunch and uh, this guy knocks on the door and he's supposed to be delivering, he is, he's delivering a, a big sprayer, right? And it's like close to two meters long. And he's like, do you have a forklift? And I was like, no, I don't have a forklift. And he's like, well, it says you need a forklift to get it off. And I was like, it's a, it's on a trailer, mate. We could just wheel it off. And he was like, yeah. I don't have time for that. And I was like, so what are you saying? He's like, oh, we'll come back tomorrow. And I didn't need it today. I was like, this guy's had a bad day. I, I didn't need it. If I needed it, I would have been like, no, you're not coming back tomorrow. We're going to cut the straps holding it on. We're going to roll it off your truck. But it was a bit yeah. weird. Do you think he's just had it like, I don't know what it's like driving a truck, but I was like, why? Maybe his mate's driving tomorrow. And the last thing he wants to do is come back here. And he's just hand passing it off to the next guy. But uh, I don't yeah, know. I mean- you're, re- you're relating to this hearing that story, right? I certainly am. I mean, you know, the industry that I work in, it's tanker driving. Um, and it, it's a little bit different to the, the general freight side of things or the palletized goods. Um, but, you know, drivers have a bad day sometimes. Operations have a bad day sometimes. And I think, you know, traffic obviously does frustrate people. But when things don't go to plan, um, everybody does get frustrated. And unfortunately, it's the end customer that quite often it kind of gets taken out on. So I certainly do relate to that. I don't know. I I think he I think he yeah I think he's hand passing. I think he's given his whatever. Whoever's on tomorrow is going to have a bad day because he's just been lumped with everything this guy had still to do. But uh, yeah, so yeah, transport. So then working in agriculture, you do a lot of fertilizers and stuff. 
Um, so when I say agriculture, we, you know, we do a lot of uh, direct off farm milk collection. Um, that's oh, one of the largest right. parts of their business. So obviously we collect raw milk and then deliver that to the processing factories um, to make all the, you know, various dairy goods, milks, cheeses, creams. Um, that's probably one part of our business. And then the the second side on the, the food side um, is a lot of your liquid line haul stuff. So you could be looking at sugars and um, juices, et cetera. So, yeah, not so much the grain side of agriculture or fertilizers, but more that food food side of it. So do you – so you're taking stuff from the farm, not to the farm. Um, yeah. How do you – How do you, I mean, this has got nothing to do with gardening, but does milk come in like IBC containers or does it come in like a, like a tanker, like a fuel tanker size? How do you transport milk? Yeah, look, so we've got um, stainless steel tanks that we have. You know, they could be up to 85 and a half tonne, um, which is the legal weight limit over – quite a lot of the areas around where we do, obviously on certain roads. Um, you know, farmers' vats could be anywhere from kind of a 1,000 litres to, you know, 20,000 litres in some instances. Um, and if you think of the sheer size of that, the actual transport equipment needed to move that, it's just, it's phenomenal. Like some of the pieces are over 30 metres long from prime mover to the end of the trailer set. Yeah, well, it probably cost a, li- cost a few cups of coffee, you know. Just a few, mate. Just a few. <clears throat> so how did you get, so going from that, it's, it sounds to me that like, you know, you've got an interesting, oh, how would you put it? There's a, there's a, it's a challenging job. People get grumpy. Is going to the garden, you said, is kind of an escape from that. Did you ever have any kind of passion for it growing up or was, is it something that you just kind of fell into, you know, not that you're old, but like maturing maybe? Yeah, look, I think some of the earliest memories that I do have, um, I'm out with mum and dad mowing the front lawn where I grew up. You know, we we lived on a bit of property um, and every Saturday morning it was almost a ritual. We'd jump on the old rider mower Mm -hmm. and we'd cut the grass for, you know, three or four hours and then I'd go out with mum and dad and we'd be planting conifer trees or, you know, um, the dreaded yuccas. There was a phase where we'd go through that. Um, Everybody had that phase. Love, like bleach tips. Everyone's trying to be Justin Timberlake. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you're doing that so, as a know, kid growing from... up. Sorry? Oh, yeah, you go. You go. Yeah, I was just going to say from a from a young age, I have been, you know, interested in it. Um, and it probably wasn't until my now wife and I purchased our house in was it, yeah, mid-2019. Um, I thought, you know, I'm going to get myself into gear and really set up the backyard exactly how I want it so that, you know, eventually when we do have kids, I can kind of give them that same joy um, that I had growing up. And I, I think it's such a value to like the, that type of work for kids because, you know, like you spend so much time indoors today because I was kind of similar that my parents, you know, we, we did have veggie patches growing up. We actually renovated houses growing up and we'd kind of, help out as much as an eight-year-old or 10-year-old could but it's yeah. there's something about working with your hands when you're young which i think there's some value to that like one is obviously just hard work is you know preparing you for life but also like being able to see fruit from your like literally if you're growing you know trees or whatever but like the fruit of your labor or seeing the things you planted grow or you know the chickens you're looking after lay eggs and yeah, this, there's a value to that that carries through to older age, which I think is a little bit underrated. It's they're, they're chores to do, but it doesn't feel like chores, you know? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things that we notice, um, in particularly around some of the, the young kids, um, you know, even my, my brother and sister-in-laws, they, they play a lot of video games and not that there's anything wrong with that, but I was just never that person. Kind of the outdoors has always attracted me. Um, so, you know, as long as it's not pouring rain, I mean, even sometimes then I'm outside, but you know, I just love it. I spend the majority of the week indoors. So yeah, doing yeah. that stuff is certainly not, not a some exercise. Yeah. It's funny. And it's funny what makes, what, what feels like work to people. Cause I reckon there's a whole bunch of people on here who are listening right now, who are mowing lawns, cutting hedges, because that's what they do as a profession. And the last thing they can think of doing on the weekend, they'd be like, 
give me a transport job on a Saturday. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like I want to sit on a laptop and do air conditioning, anything, you know what I mean? Like it's funny how, it's funny how certain, it's just being, doing something that's different to what you normally do, even though it might be yeah. considered work to some people. It's just, it's just not, it's for other people. It's, it's a break. It's, it's funny how the brain, I guess, work like that sometimes. Yeah, I mean, you, you've probably heard the saying, um, find something that you like doing and you've never worked a day in your life. I probably don't subscribe to that saying. Um, you know, plenty of people that I've grown up with, gone to school and uni with, they've kind of done their their hobbies or their passions as their job and it, it, they end up hating it. I mean, when was the last time you saw a mechanic with a, a well-maintained car? My brother-in-law is a mechanic and his car's falling apart. So that, that's kind of the approach that I have, keep my hobbies separate from my, my work. And I just find that I enjoy it more. Yeah, I, I do find that uh, people in the gardening industry, it, you, you is a lot of people who get into it get into it because of the work for yourself aspect, not necessarily the love for plants. There's still there, and there is a difference between say like mowing lawn on mass, you know, ten a day, fifteen a day, more if you've got small jobs, and um, maintaining veggies. It's a different kind of you know, it's a different pace. So I, I know I know there's people who listen to this who do both. It's just an interesting thing. So now you started 2019, halfway through. When did you start on Instagram? Because you've got 20 something thousand followers now or something like that, which is, which it's kind of weird talking to people like this sometimes because I like, I like your stuff. I look at your stuff and I think you're doing a good job. But it's always the kind of weird how the internet works and that, you know, someone with, with, you know, relatively, new experience there's people who've been doing it for 60 years they don't even have an instagram and they've got all this knowledge and we never hear of them and there's some people out there who are new to it doing some great stuff and twenty thousand people forty thousand, whatever it is so i mean i'm rambling a bit but you started pretty recently how does it feel to you then to be like oh well all these people are interested in what i'm doing yeah look honestly surprised um you know we were saying before I can't remember the exact date that we started it, but um, basically the first lot of stuff that I grew at home had failed um, and it was growing the wrong stuff at the wrong time of the year. And I thought I need a way that um, I can actually document this stuff and, you know, have photos of where I position stuff. And it works taking photos on a phone, but then you, you probably don't really look back at photos from three, four, five years ago to see what works. So that, that was kind of the reason that I started my Instagram page, um, really around that date time stamping of stuff. Um, and then, yeah, it's just grown and people have interacted and, you know, I've talked to people most days. Um, I'm certainly no expert and don't claim to be, but, um, I feel like we've been able to help some people with at least what works for me in my environment. Um, you mentioned before, you know, I live in Victoria, you live over in WA and the, just the climates are fundamentally different. So what works for you may not necessarily work for some somebody else. And if I can help somebody achieve a bit of success in their garden, then that's that's all the better. Yeah, and I think it's like getting back to what you're saying before, like what I was saying about you is that you're a relatable guy. So I feel like you're, you, you're not like, I think people probably message you because they feel like you're on the same team as them. You know what I mean? You're not someone who's too, too uh, high and mighty for, for the average Joe. What's the weirdest question? What's some of the weirdest they, questions you get? <clears throat> oh, I'm, some of the weird questions we get is what should I plan at what time of year? I know that sounds pretty basic, but um, a lot of people don't don't know what to plant. They go to Bunnings and they find a, a clearance special. And, um, we know that generally they're end of season goods. Um, yeah, I, I probably haven't had weird questions. It's more more a lot of how-tos and what should I do in this case. Um, yeah. Yeah. Can't really I, think of a weird question that I've had. I get annoyed at questions, hey. Like sometimes, I, I mean, not all questions, but some <laughs> questions I really get annoyed at. I, I had a guy message me and um, <clears throat> sorry for throwing you under the bus, mate. But uh, if he's listening to this, he probably won't be. It's a bloke who um, went to school with me and uh, he was actually in my sister's class. And many years ago, he asked us to do some work, like, like this is 10 years old or something, so maybe nine years ago, eight years ago, he asked us to do some work and we helped him out. And 
Anyway, he's sort of guy that you'd say hello to if you walked into him to Coles, but he's not. Yeah, you know, he's not a close mate. And he sent me he sent me a picture of his back lawn the other day, and and we were talking off here about how little rain we've had and uh, in in Perth. And uh, this guy sent me this photo of his lawn. His his back lawn's like dead, but it's clear that there's been no water. He hasn't watered his lawn, and he was like, "What do you reckon I should do here?" <laughs> I'm just like. Well, do you have functioning reticulation? And he's like, I don't have any reticulation. And I like, I didn't say it, but I was like, yeah, I can tell. <laughs> I'm like, you know, like, have you ever considered there's this thing called water and it's like essential for all life forms? And perhaps, maybe yeah. if you pray about it, you might find that that's the, li- that's the missing link you've got. So some questions like that, I'm just like, oh, I'm kind of sick of answering dumb questions. And I, I, I know I shouldn't be because it's an, it's a nice position to, and I don't, I don't take it out. But you know, this guy who was doing it, I was, I've thrown him with the bus cause he's someone I went to school with, but it's kind of like, you do get some of those questions sometimes. And I don't know, do you, you, yeah. you're probably a lot more patient than me, I would guess. Oh, I don't, don't know if I'm more patient. Um, but yeah, I, I do get some weird questions, you know, what, what should I apply here or how should I dig? I'm actually probably the weirdest question was what should I use to dig a hole? And kind of my first answer was a shovel. <laughs> yes. But, um, Not the tip of your nose. Have yeah. you tried, have you tried your earlobes? <laughs> I think what they were trying to get to is, you know, those um, drill attachments, the drill augers, they were trying to understand yeah. what size to use. And I just, I think the way that they messaged it didn't quite come across, but um yeah, look, I'm more than happy to answer questions. I, I, I want to preface. I'm certainly no expert in what I say may or may not work, but um, yeah, happy to answer anything. Yeah, I, I do. I am also, but just don't ask me dumb questions, right, people? It has to be slightly, <laughs> slightly thought through before you, before you send something. But it, it is interesting how the internet, the internet attracts certain kind of people do you know what i mean like this it's like the people i don't know if you've seen those memes where people will post a question that they could ask to google but they'll post it on facebook and there's all these people who post yeah. all these questions and it's like you're waiting for someone to respond like you could have you could have had the answer by now you know so there's there's people who would do that and then on the flip side there's people who will be like watch every single video you do follow you to the to the you know nth degree for 10 years and never comment never like never message as a whole it's a fascinating thing when you get yourself in front of twenty thousand people like you are you're going to have the whole spectrum of people commenting following haters lovers all that sort of stuff yeah i mean i quite often see a couple of guys um that i follow quite regularly and they post you know funny comments that they get and a lot of it's around that hate side of it and Hmm. I probably haven't experienced that um, much wood, but you know a lot of the communities that we deal with are, are quite nice. Um, you know, people are always more than helpful, and I, I probably haven't seen that bad side that a lot of people do yet. So I'm, interesting, I'm it stays that way. So why do you think that is? Why do you think someone like because um, I oh, we've got um, Lawns and Good Nick coming on tomorrow, as long as you know something doesn't go wrong, and he's one of these guys that that um, people love to hate sometimes. I think it's because he's, uh, I've got some ideas on it. We'll talk about it tomorrow. I'll, I'll talk to him about it, uh, why he thinks it is. But I think it's because he's kind of, um, I think it's a bit of tall puppy syndrome. But yeah, it, it could be a few different things. Yeah. But why, why do you think certain people attract it? You know, why do you think, do you just think maybe you're better looking than Nick? And so, you know, people just, you know, I don't know, they're distracted by that or something. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, look, I personally love his stuff. I mean, I think the other day his um, wife made a, an account, which yeah. like, that's hilarious. That stuff is probably what I go on social media to look for, um, yeah. that kind of satellite stuff. But um, I, I, I don't know how to answer it, mate. There's um, people that have got nothing better to do in the world, I think. You know, it takes just as much effort to co- comment something nicely as it does poorly. And, you know, people want to waste their time probably just been keyboard warriors, I think. Yeah. I was even even talking to this with uh, Tim the Lawnmower Man the other day because somebody commented on one of my videos, uh, that one of the um, reels that we had done from the podcast we did together. And 
over a four or five month period, the same person had commented five or six negative things about Tim. Um, but the thing that I, the guy didn't, the guy didn't realize is, um, Tim wasn't tagged in the post. Right. So Tim didn't see it. Right. So, but I had a laugh with Tim because the guy said, um, uh, Tim, the tall, tall man or something like that. And, uh, then he said something about him being a wanker or something. I can't even remember. And I sent a message to Tim saying, this guy has very poor judgment. He thinks you're tall. You know, the joke obviously yeah. being that we all agree he's a wanker, but which is, I don't believe he is. <laughs> That's a joke. But um, yeah, anyway, so I, I, I deleted this guy after that because I was like, this guy's no, like, I don't, what, why? This guy keeps coming back to this video every five months and I blocked him from it. And then Tim was like, why'd you block him, yeah. mate? Like, the best, the best thing is to give him, uh, you know, make him look at it, <laughs> you know, make him see the content all the time. I was like, oh, yeah, interesting. That's an interesting philosophy. I guess you haven't had much to think about with this stuff because you don't get hate because everybody must just think you're very, I don't know. I don't know what they think. Well, I'm sure it probably happens behind the scenes, but um, yeah, it, I mean, even if I did, did get it, I would uh, I'd probably just ignore it. It doesn't, it's not something that phases me. Like I said, it, it was more of a thing to document what I do and if I can use that to just, you know, show what what I do on the weekend and whatnot. I'm I'm more than happy to just ignore people that don't enjoy it. I mean, I'd say to them to scroll on, but yeah, they probably wouldn't listen. No, they wouldn't. Just to, just block them or don't block them. Now let's get into the actual gardening side of it because this is what we wanted to get you on here. Your is it five veggie patches? I think when I was reading before that you've got um, how many oh, individual areas are you actually growing yeah, food in? Probably. It's probably about eight or nine, I think, that we've got all up, um, various different sizes. Um, this year is probably the first year that we've moved everything out the backyard. Um, mm -hmm. We had a, a big gum tree in the backyard for a few years, and last year we had to cut it down. Um, but it's changed the landscape of the backyard. So finally, we've got light on probably one half. Um, if you didn't know, we're, we're on about 650 square metres. Um, our backyard's about... 300 ish um, yep. in total so it, it's quite a good space to have raised garden beds um you know plus a, a lawn that it'd be nicer if the dogs didn't run around on it every day but you know they love it it's doing um, well it's doing quite so well we for a lawn. It's, it's doing quite well for dog lawn i have to say from the, unless you're just taking the photos of the one patch that's really quite nice. I mean, you could be doing that too. A bit like the, a bit like all the dead plants I pulled off this green wall before we started recording. Uh, but, but, but it looks uh, for the two dogs and how big they are and the size of the backyard. I think you're doing pretty good. Yeah. Look, I mean, there's been a lot of work that's gone into it. Um, when we bought the the house, the soil just, you know, there was no life. It was um, couldn't even tell you what the composition. It's kind of like a clay clay base and then it's just this really gross sandy soil on top so you know we've done what's that four seasons of top dressing um a couple with sand and a couple with some really nice organic um stuff and that's that's probably helped it um you know certainly removing that tree and getting a bit more light into the backyard um that's definitely helped it as well um you know the dogs do provide a bit of free fertilizer every now and then but um yeah i mean we do our best to make it look good and enjoy with our friends and family. Friends, I hope you're going well. I'm in the warehouse because I want to show you this. This is, amongst all the mess, the new background for the podcast for 2024. Uh, maybe even slightly after Christmas, we might do a podcast with this. But I want to show you it because we're going to make some epic content for the next year. I've got a lot of plans. Can't tell you about them now, but they're super exciting. And if you want to be part of that, jump on the Patreon. Keep supporting it. Genuinely, all this stuff is being paid by the people who support on there. I want to show you this as well. This is my fertilizer rack with all the Mash Play products from the Lawn Shed. Now, you can only get these products, which are exactly the stuff I'm using. You can see it's in, it's in the rack there. Uh, if you get a trade account, so sign to a trade account, jump on there, you'll be able to get access to that sort of stuff because it's not on the normal Lawn Shed account. So, you heard about us through the podcast and go through there. If you're looking for fertilizers, wedding agents, all that kind of stuff. That's where we grab everything. They've been awesome supporters for the podcast. And it's partly 
what allows us to do the cool things we're doing now. Let's get back into the podcast. So what's in the in the eight nine veggie patches you've got? Um, what's the stuff that you're growing down now? Now you're uh, for those who who don't know Victoria very well. We were looking at this before. You're kind of near Geelong, so quite southern in terms of yeah. of where Australia is. Um, so I guess a fairly cold climate, um, not necessarily typical Australian climate, although you know it's still Australia. But what kind of stuff have you oh, grown still, this yeah, year? Hot. What was that? Sorry, it, it still gets hot. Like we might have four days over thirty-two every year if we're lucky, um, especially the last few years. But um, yeah, it's certainly cold. We do get a lot of rain. You know, we've had I think since middle of Sunday about eighty-two mil um, in the rain gauge, which is phenomenal. I think you said you only had what two mil since. Let's get this up. November. Because this is a, we would we would talk, we got all the stats up, people, before we um, uh, we came on. Uh, there, there we go. That's the layout. So, <clears throat> well, the temperatures on here. You said four days above thirty-two, didn't you? Roughly a year, you reckon? Just as a, a, a random guess, you were saying. I might be exaggerating. That. It feels like it. But we've got what have we got here? We got so today is twenty-nine or was twenty-nine? I don't know how that works. Tomorrow's thirty. 32, 34, 37, 36, 32, 33. That's the next week in Perth. And so I guess, I don't know, that's probably more hot days than you're getting in your area. You Googling your temperature now, are you? We'll compare. I am. So we're sitting on. We're 21 degrees. That's a nice. That's a nice. That's a nice day. Yeah, look, lo- lovely day. Um, tomorrow I think max for twenty four. Um, what have we got? The highest over the next seven days is going to be twenty four. Twenty four and cloudy. So over the next seven days, the coolest day over the next seven days <laughs> is is thirty. Is it thirty? That's yeah. Tomorrow. Tomorrow is thirty. Day. The low of tomorrow in Perth is 21. <laughs> so your maximum today is tomorrow's minimum for us. And, and you know what? Like, yeah. this is technically we're in the same. I know we're in the same con- country, but like, you know, really, if you put you put Australia almost anywhere else on the, on the earth except for maybe USA and Russia, there's been there'd be 17 yeah. countries between the two of us. <laughs> but the yep. thing that's yeah, really absolutely. interesting is the rainfall because um, we got this up before. So you've had in January, I'm going to try and move this to an area that I can see a little bit better. So you've had in Melbourne, oh, this is Melbourne people, but you've had 82 mil in January. Let's see if I can make this work right. Um, if I go December, December 2024 doesn't exist. December, how much rain? What's your guess? 200? 200 mil for rain in Melbourne? Oh, no, I'd probably say maybe 90. Oh, 71. I got too optimistic because oh, I saw how much. So um, your average is 58. So you've had 71 mil, and then I'll, we'll just go to November just for the fun of it. So what was it? 80 something, 70 something, and then November. What do you reckon November was? I've got, I'm, I'm not going to make try pretend. Oh, I reckon yeah. November was a bit higher. I'd 42. Say maybe about 50 for November. There you go. So, yeah, yeah, 42. So then, so what was it? 80, 70, 42. Here's Perth's rainfall. So um, January is currently zero, and you guys have had 82. December, zero. November, 5.2. October, 8.2. September, 44.8. So I think we said before, in the nine days of January, you guys had, what, 80-something mils, and Perth in four and a half months. What do we work it out to be? 59 mil? 60 mil? It was something like that. It's just, it's crazy. So I didn't didn't do, so you had, what what was it, 80, 70, which would be 150 plus 40, 190, and let's do October um, as well, just to... Just to get a feel for it. 
Cause it, what is it? About? 76. So you guys are somewhere around 250 mil in the period of time that Perth's Sorry. getting. Yeah, something like that. 260 in a Perth. About that, well, that was, I've included September. That was October, November, December, and January. You guys have had 250, 260 mil, and Perth has had 13 <laughs> mil. <laughs> Point four or something like that. It's like, that's nuts, hey? It's, it, yeah, same country, apparently. And we're not that far off each other in terms of latitude. Perth is, Perth is further north, but it's not like we're bloody cans or something stupid. So it's, it's such a fascinating thing. So it's, it's why it makes sense for you to do what you've done because there are a lot of people who live around your area and you creating a kind of diary on Instagram is – it's not um, scientific in the sense of it being a study, but it is – it's very strong anecdotal evidence, very helpful for people in the area who want it to do that because it's – yeah, like you can get all this information online, but it's it's kind of irrelevant if you – you know, if you live in Perth and you're like, oh, my veggies are doing great. Haven't watered them once. It's like, well, in Perth, yeah. nothing's surviving, you know, maybe some cacti. So, yeah. yeah. It's certainly different. Um, but, I mean, even, you know, we were talking just before, you know, that that's a small portion of Victoria and some other places, you know, there was over 100 mil in one night. Um, you mentioned nice. you have a nick on you know, tomorrow's podcast, um, I think I saw a video of him taking his kids down to the, you know, the river which flooded. So I can only imagine the amount that he's out down there. Yeah. Well, I don't know what part of Victoria he's in. Uh, I don't know. We'll probably ask him tomorrow. Yeah, fascinating thing. So so what have you found in your area has been the most surprising in a good way this year, specifically with, with veggies growing food? Um, great, great, great yield, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, look, I mean, probably the garlic. It's been the best, best year that I've ever had. I think in total we got, you know, forty odd heads that were, you know, a decent size. Um, we didn't have any rot this year, which was, you know, really good. Um, I, I really didn't have to water water that at all. Um, I mean, the zucchinis have been pumping out for two or three months now. Um, we're probably pulling you know, three or four a day. And um, we've probably only got maybe four or five plants at the moment. Um, so it's, it's a candy fritters almost every night uh, or at least for lunch each week. Um, so they've been really good. Um, tomatoes are just coming into season. So I've probably done two or three harvests at the moment. Um, you know, I've got quite a lot of tomato plants, you know, early, mid season and late season uh, to kind of extend that out. But They've been doing really well. Um, probably doesn't surprise me because if you can't grow a tomato, well, you yeah. probably do need some help. But, um... Yeah, re- reconsider your reconsider your hobby <laughs> if you're struggling with that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, you know, I- I've certainly struggled with a lot of stuff. Um, you know, this year the powdery mildew—that's absolutely decimated the pumpkins that we've got. Um, and something that I'm growing for the first time, which is a Guatemalan banana squash. Um, what the heck is that? that no, what is it? I'm gonna, I'll Google it. I'll get a Guatemalan banana yeah. slush. It sounds like a cocktail. Certainly a bit eclectic. Um, I never heard of it actually. Um, and I thought, what's something weird that I can grow this year that you know we might see what it tastes if I grow it again? Um, apparently, it's like a cross between a butternut pumpkin and a sweet potato in terms of taste. So I, I am looking forward to that being ready. Is that is it? Have I got this on the screen? Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. Well, I might have got the name slightly wrong, but Guatemalan blue banana exactly squash. It, it kind of looks like a butternut butternut pumpkin, doesn't it? Like, I mean, it's blue on the outside. It's kind of like a big, fat blue zucchini, and then in the inside looks like a pumpkin. Yeah, yeah. And like, if you you know, you take them in in real life, they're, they're huge. Like, they're probably two or three footballs big. Right. Yeah. Oh, I can see. Yeah. This lady holding one. That's deceptive. Like, because this here does not look big, does it? Like, looking at that photo, that just looks like, I don't know, the size of my hand span or looks something. Like big... And then you look at this, this big hunking thing there. It's like elbow to elbow on this lady. 
Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So what did you say it tasted like? Well, we haven't actually had one yet, but I've heard it tastes a bit like a cross between sweet potato and a butternut pumpkin. So I reckon there's still probably another two or three weeks before that's ready um, to try. So I'll let you know. I, I always wonder, tell me what you think about this. You know, when whenever you used to watch TV or, or YouTube videos now and the chef makes a dish and they always, mm, it's so good, you know, and you're like, is it? <laughs> because you can't, you can't yeah. go through the process of cooking something and then be like, actually, this is kind of average. You shouldn't, you shouldn't bother. You know what I mean? I feel the same way with people who grow stuff yeah. and then they eat it and they're like, oh, it's so good. I'm like, well, maybe, but I'm always doubting. Cause I'm like, are you just saying that? Cause you can't, you can't admit you stuffed up now. Can you like, you can't be like, this is a horrible decision. I know some people are, but. I wonder. I wonder if some of these weirder plants. Because why haven't I heard of that? If it was so yummy and tasty. Because I love sweet potato and I love pumpkin. Why haven't I heard of it? Maybe it's a secret yeah. that we are all about to discover. Or maybe it actually tastes like crap. <laughs> like I don't know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, last year we grew um, the like the yellow zucchini. Um, I think mm-hmm. it's yellow squash for technical term. Um, and I hated it. You know, yeah. I think I planted three or four for um, plants last year and we got heaps of them and I, I couldn't give them away fast enough. They were terrible. Um, but lots of people like them and keep growing them. So I'm certainly not, not afraid to say I don't like something and I'll never grow that again, put it that way. Well, yeah, I've fallen for that trap too. I saw I saw you posted the other day about your dogs eating your tomatoes because um, I've had that problem with my dog eating especially the cherry tomatoes. Um, so I haven't grown tomatoes for many years since, but many years ago, I grew some of those yellow, what's the word? It was, it was, they were golden something cherry tomatoes looked amazing, like proper yellow, golden color. And you mix them in with the red ones. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's such an Instagrammable photo and they just had no flavor. It was, you know how some, um, you know, you get that little sort of, a little bit of taste. It was like a lot of bit of taste. Not so much that you you couldn't eat it. It was inedible. Um, but you kind of like if yeah. it was in a salad mixed with everything, you you kind of didn't notice it because it was kind of it was just you know like it's a, a slight bit of taste. But if you just ate it, like if you just go and eat a cherry tomato, you're like, oh, this is nice and sweet. It's just being bred to look sexy. I mean, that's my that's my unless yeah. I, I just stuffed up how I was growing it. I don't know what I did to screw it up, but. Anyways, whatever it, it just it was great for the uh, great for the I don't know the compliments, but not for the taste buds. Yeah, well, I mean, we oh, I, I grew one last year, the Tigerella tomato, and looks fantastic. You know, it's got this beautiful um, red with kind of an orange stripe on it, and you know, the one plant produced tens of kilos of um, tomatoes. It was all right in a in a sandwich, but I certainly wouldn't be eating it and maybe that's just my taste bug um but you know didn't plant that this year went with what i like so i think there's there's some stuff that it looks sexy it's bred to look really nice um people do grow it just to take photos um yeah i certainly wouldn't be growing that one again what what do you think to what do you think is the, the biggest culprit the instagram thing people grow just for the photos but no one actually eats it I haven't got anything in mind, but now I'm thinking about it. I reckon there's a bunch of things that people just grow just for the photos. I've always said glass gem corn. So right, if it, do you know what yep. that is? Is that the multicolored yeah. one um, with the different? I'll, I'll get it on the on the screen. Yeah, keep talking. Yeah. It it looks really cool, and I've wanted to grow it just to say I've grown it. But every time I look at you know people that have grown it, what have they used it for? Oh, we've made popcorn. Oh, cool. Cool. I can go down to the supermarket and buy a bag of popcorn. Um, cheap, you know, I, I'm going to grow sweet corn. It doesn't look that nice, but I'll certainly eat it every day. There is, so you know, is there is the something. One people grow. I reckon you're right. hundred percent. That's an Instagram thing, but it kind of looks like there's something wrong with it as well. For those who, who are listening, it's like yellow, dark blue, red. There's like a, some green. It's like, it's kind of like, like a rainbow kind of, I mean, there's different ones. These ones are like black. 
but yeah, like it's a multicolored corn kind of thing. And, uh, but it kind of looks like it's almost like gone rotten kind of, do you know what I mean? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, look, this is probably ancient corn. I think they call it again, not an expert, but a lot of people say that this is what food used to look like. I'm sure it did, but for me, that doesn't really look appetizing. I do feel like this sometimes with people like they want to feel that natural thing and go back to, to our origins. But I don't know if you've seen what avocados used to look like. It was like 50%. Instead of it being like a little bit of pit, a little bit of seed and quite a lot of flesh, it was like uh, you know, hardly any flesh at all. It was all seed. And a lot of these breeding programs are natural breeding programs. They're not like GMO where someone's firing DNA into a into a plant to, to get it to change. It's just they're, they're, they're picking the ones that have the most flesh and then breeding them with the other ones that have the most flesh and doing that <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of generations and then all of a sudden you get a Hass avocado and I'd prefer that if I was you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the biggest thing is probably chilies that I like to do. Um, I'm, I think third year in, trying to do a bit of a crossbreed in some of the chilies that we do. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of working. Um, it's going to take several more years, I think. But that natural stuff, I think, is really cool. Um, mm-hmm. Create new breeds. I, I used to have a guy we used to work with. He, I, was a, I was a gardener in a school and he, is, he was the cleaner. But his hobby was chilies. And I think he had a thousand yep. chili plants or something like that at his house. And it was, he had a greenhouse. It was, I never saw it. But we used to talk all the time about it. And it was just, that was his thing. He just absolutely loved everything and anything to do with chilies and, and just getting them as hot as possible. And, and I was like, do you really like hot food? And he's like, not really. I was like, weird. It's just, he just loved the challenge of breeding these chilies and growing new varieties and getting them in from other growers. And it was, it was not the eating it as, as much, although he did make chili jam and things like that. It was, it was the challenge of growing yeah. the new species. It's funny how there's all these little nooks and crannies in the gardening world. That's, you know, you know what I mean? Like that, you, there's so many ways you can be an expert and the rest of us, even though we might have been doing stuff for 20 years, we go chat with the, the chili guy and we feel like we're idiots and we don't know a single thing because their world is just, they've honed that for so long, you know? Yeah. Oh, look, I, I completely get that. Um, I, I like to think probably my go-to thing to grow is the chili. Um, I, I love the hot stuff. One of my best mates is a chef and we create you know, different chili jam recipes and whatnot. And um, the... Probably the thing that blew my mind the most was one day when I went and bought the Jay's um, scorpion peach chili from this guy and he bred hundreds of different types of chilies and it was just really, really cool to kind of see that challenge and I walked in there and I just felt like I had absolutely no idea about stuff I've been growing for years. Yeah, so look, one of my best mates, um, he's a chef and we've always really enjoyed growing um, really hot stuff Um, and we've, we've always challenged each other to see who could grow something hotter and um I've, I've kind of thought that over the past few years of growing stuff I, I do know a little bit about chilies and how to grow them and what they are but one day i went um to this local guy who, who grew chilies for a living and crossbred a lot of stuff and i kind of walked into his backyard and he had the greenhouse and tent and everything set up and i was just blown away and i kind of walked in there and geez i know absolutely nothing about this um so we got yakking and I, just, I found that really cool. Um, so many different ways to do things and kind of how they breed it. Yeah, just fascinating. It, yeah, and, and I think chilies as well, for, for, at least for my eye, are a good-looking plant. I like that dark green leaf that capsicums and chilies have. And because yeah. they are what are perennials, right, it's – unless there's some of the annuals that I'm not aware of. Again, it's just not my world. But, you know, they – it's kind of like they kind of are that halfway between an ornamental and a vegetable or a food plant. And I love that. I love fruit trees for that. I love those sorts of plants like certain herbs like mint or whatever that you can just throw in the garden and you don't have to redo them all the time. 
you know, you don't have to pull out the garlic. Uh, garlic, you said, you know, like I would love to grow my own garlic. I will do it one day, but it's kind of one of those things that it is a bit of, it's a bit of extra work. Tomatoes are kind of just like, oh, throw them in there. You know, zucchinis are the same, you know, yeah. they're just there. But yeah, there's certain ones that you got to put, they, they look dead and then you change them and you got to think about what you pair them with. And chilies are kind of just, it, there's a plant, you know what I mean? Oh, look, there's some hot things on it. Yeah, I mean, look, it's a little bit different in our environment um, over here. Obviously, winters get really cold. Um, so I've had quite a few die on me in the second year. I didn't quite cut them back quick enough. Um, but, you know, three quarters of the year, they're blooming with that beautiful foliage and yeah, really good looking plants, actually. Actually, yeah, it's they're very good looking plants. The yeah. um, rose, we've, I'm currently growing a, a rosemary hedge. Um, I love a nice, sharp looking hedge, but, you know, the ability to cut rosemary, use that on our food, that's a new challenge, which I'm looking forward to. Yeah, rosemary hedges are, are funny to prune. When you get that, you know, because they grow that long, wispy yeah. uh, branch, I guess that comes up. And it's like as you're, as you're pruning it, you're hitting it. And so it kind of bends with the hedge trimmer. And then when it yeah. stands back up again, it's kind, it's at a different height. Do you know what I mean? So you push it, yeah. you're pushing it down, you cut it there, and then it stands up again. And it's up here now. And you're like, bloody useless. <laughs> and it takes so many passes. When they get more established and their branch is – further up it's it's nicer but they can be they're, they're like when you get it right it is such a nice crisp hedge because they got that small leaf but they can be quite difficult to maintain hard to quote too if you're brand new to the industry you're like oh this would be like a normal hedge three yeah. times the time for another one yeah we, we don't quite have a hedge that's that long yet it, it, you know maybe two meters in length in between the lily pillies but um hoping one day it kind of fills in i think we've got like 32 meters of fencing that I do need to cover with it eventually. So probably a have you ever thought, do you, have you guys got, you got passion fruit or can passion fruit grow where you are? It can look at, that's something that I'd love to do. Um, I just, I haven't found a space where it's going to work yet. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. I was telling you about my mate who's a chef. He's actually grown passion fruit this year. And he's kind of vined it up up against his house, and I could be really cool to grow, I reckon. Yeah, they're, they're so pretty. The, the, the passion fruit flowers as well, but I I really appreciate the like like saying that that dark green leaf color passion fruit. I, I guess there's different varieties, but most passion fruit have that. So that yeah. would be a good one. I wonder as well if you could like, you know how obviously greenhouses usually these days are cheap ones. Um, well, most of them, to be honest, are that sort of clear or, or sort of translucent plastic. I wonder if, if you wanted to keep it hot, if you could, like on a vine, just hang plastic off your fence, like plastic the whole fence, where, you know, like, you know, where, where it is, and kind of, I don't yeah. know, staple it in or for something for winter and actually get the same kind of effect. I'm thinking out loud here, but I wonder if that would work. Yeah, I don't know. It's, I mean, it's something that would be interesting to try, right? Um, where I've seen it successfully work is up against a brick wall and obviously that radiant heat, um, mm. you know, really works. But I don't know. Something that we might have to try this year. Yeah. You know, now I've thought about it, I'm going to patent the idea and uh, <laughs> you and I will make our millions off it, you know? I reckon that sounds like a plan. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't think you can make millions off just a piece of plastic, white plastic. But yeah, interesting stuff like that. I'm trying um behind me um on the camera is a so the the warehouse roof is 6 meters tall, 6 and a half meters tall or something like that. And I've got some uh racking. It's the same racking that said Bunnings, you know, the nice big tall racking. And um there's a skylight above me and I've got a banana on top of my racking near my skylight. I'm going to try it's it's this big at the moment. It's I it got out of pot like a few days ago, but I'm going to try and grow a banana indoors because it's kind of not indoors. It's it's it gets warm up there, so it's this nice warm humid climate that bananas like. It's close enough to the light that it'd be like being in a forest. It's yeah. not like on the floor or anything, 
and I, I think I've got a good chance. I think I've got a good chance to grow a banana indoors. And <coughs> excuse me, but I reckon that would be that'd be such a cool achievement if I can get it to work to be able to, to eat. A, I don't care how big it is; it could be like three centimeters. But if I can eat a banana that was grown indoors from start to finish, that'd be pretty cool. Is it a dwarf one or a full size banana? Uh, so, it's full size. Yeah. <laughs> There's uh, between where it is and the roof, I would say is two and a half meters. Yeah. If I was to, if I was to stand on the pot, there might be a meter or so. Yeah, I couldn't touch the roof standing where it is. So it's probably yeah. it's probably three, three and a half, four meters up in the air on this racking system. And then it's it's got a long way to go. So it could grow. There's a there's a full size frangipani tree next to it. So yeah, yeah. The frangipani is taller than me. So yeah. But I, yeah, I, one day I'll I'll do stuff. But I I love trying in this warehouse specifically because it's just concrete everywhere. You can water everything. Blah blah. I like experimenting yeah. with things. Uh, before we um, we came on, I took down two dead. <laughs> well. Very close to dead. They'll recover. Um, hydrangeas that I tried on this wall and I kind of knew they wouldn't work, but I was like, I'm just going to give them a chance anyway. They were cheap. They were on sale. I think they were $3 each. So I tried, but yeah. I love trying those new plants and, and just doing things that maybe won't work. But it doesn't really matter anyway. You're probably doing that a lot in your veggie patch too, I, I would guess. Yeah, look, I've probably got one one bed, which is probably three years old now, and that's kind of dedicated to new random things. I mean, something that um, I grew for the first time last year was a watermelon. Um, granted, it was grown in a pot, um, but, you know, it was kind of a, a decent size. Um, and I thought we'd never be able to grow a, a watermelon in this climate. So, you know, this year that bed, I've, I've extended the experiment a little bit. So we've got a couple of um, watermelon vines and there's, you know, a couple of fruit on there now. So... I certainly do like experimenting with that. Um, I probably don't show it as much as I, I, I should. Um, but, you know, th there's going to be successes and there's going to be failures in that. Um, I'm, I'm happy to live with that as long as I know I've tried to do it. So, Watermelon, what's um, what else are you challenging yourself with or do you have plans to challenge yourself with? Or is there something that you might want to challenge yourself with but you haven't... You haven't got the cojones yet to try. Um, look, I'm, I'm probably going to say leafy greens. Um, I've I've tried to grow spinach very unsuccessfully. It was only a small bit. Um, probably ended up growing it as an undercrop. So I'd love to try that again. Um, you know, I, I grew onions for the first time this season very late they were very small um but i'd love to probably expand that range um you know going into to next season um but yeah leafy greens i mean i don't really grow a lot of them um i don't consume a lot of it my, my wife does um but we, we love asian food so you know growing warm box and kind of mm. those cabbagey type things um that's something i definitely want to get get more into um and, you know, one thing that I do want to challenge myself with next year is kind of around that food preservation. So I listened to the episode the other day with Little Big Farm. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, a, I guess, a group that I've been following for a little while. And it did give me some ideas on what we could do um, around pickling of veggies and bits and pieces. Yeah. So, you know, I'm really keen to challenge myself um, going forward with some of that stuff. So probably not necessarily always growing the food, but actually how we use it post-growing it. Yeah, it's a funny thing when you you kind of you start going down this rabbit trail of you know, and I think a lot of people it's like it was lawns. It was lawns were like the uh, gateway drug into yeah. this because it was like, oh, I'm stuck at my house. It's COVID. Let me try my lawn. Get it looking green. And you're like, well, my lawn's green now. This has been fun. Oh, I like making things green. Well, I like eating too. Let's go into getting some, making some food. And then you go down there and you're like, well, I wouldn't mind some chickens, you know, and then I wouldn't mind pickling some stuff. Next minute, you're homeschooling your kids, you know, you've got 15, you got 15,000 fruit and veggies growing everywhere. You, you haven't eaten anything from the shop in three years. 
you know, you're doing your whole compost thing, you know, <laughs> you're like them slaughtering your own animals and gutting them and it's, but it's it's an interesting thing. I I think what they're doing is really really cool, and and I think a lot of people are that's why they're, they're a fascinating couple. But and and yourself yeah. as well, like people that like, oh, this is really, it for whatever reason, financial or just interest or like yourself, just wanting to get out of out of the, the office and do something outside as a hobby. There's a lot of interest in the whole thing. So pickling, you wanted to get into. Do you eat a lot of pickled stuff, or is it more for the challenge? Um, look, no, I do eat, do eat quite a lot of it. Um, you know, as I've mentioned just before, one of my best mates is a chef and when I was going through uni, I did work with him for a little bit. And so I do have a bit of experience in the kitchen um, in doing some of it, but haven't really gone, you know, that kind of home scale stuff. Um, so I, I'm certainly wanting to get more into that and probably just trying new foods. I mean, or the same foods, but in a different way. That's something that I'm certainly interested in. I've got an idea for you, mate, to um, connect with your listeners. Have you ever thought about doing a pop-up uh, restaurant? Have you have you seen the people who do this? What you could do, you get you yeah. get your mate, the chef, and uh, pre-plan it with him. Grow a bunch of veggies, right? And once a year, once every six months, do a, like a pop-up little restaurant thing where you yeah. get a twenty, thirty people who follow your Instagram come and they pay for. A meal that is cooked by your mate, completely out of stuff grown in your garden, probably except for yeah. the meat, you know, like that would be a bit difficult. We're not trying to catch some stray magpies and cook them for lunch, Charlie. <laughs> but, but the stuff like that, like that would be cool. I'd I'd be, I mean, if I was in, in you know, the, the state, I would, I would drive for that. I'd be like, oh, Cam's doing this thing. Sweet. I don't know. I, yeah. I just... I come up with these weird ideas. So when you do that, I want a cut of all all proceeds. You know, if you make some money from. It. Yeah, look, I mean, actually, we we have had an idea. There's plenty of cool local markets around us, and you know, around the chili side, mm -hmm. um, and plenty of people create hot sauces. And you know, there seems to be a competition on who can make the hottest sauce. But I'd love to just do weird and wonderful flavors and different colors of the sauces, and almost. Um, I don't know, do a pop-up around that side of it. I think that's yep. pretty cool. Yeah. Well, you've got to kind of get – you've got to kind of make it work with, with your zucchinis at some stage and your tomatoes because you already know that you're going to have so many of them. You kind of got to get rid of them yep. at some stage. You can't eat that many zucchinis and tomatoes. So your recipe has to have something of that in it. Do you want to <laughs> – well, That's the, the benefit of the relishes, right? Most of it is tomatoes. True. So there we go. Tomatoes, chilies. You've got to find some use for the zucchini. I don't know what you're doing with that. And um, you've got to put some some stupid plant in there just to like, you know, like a, a quarter of a quarter of a microgram in it, but just to be able to say yeah. that you did that, you know? And uh, yeah. whether it's your, your glass gem corn or your, what is it, blue Guatemalan squash thing? Banana squash. Banana squash. Yeah. It doesn't look like banana at all. It's... it's they just they just start throwing random words to make it interesting. You know what I mean? If they just call it this this yeah. long long bluish looking pumpkin, no one buys it. But Gu Guatemalan blue banana squash thing. But you know, you throw something in that because you know what they do at the restaurants. It's like you know, honey from the nectar of you know the soul of the greatest tennis player in the history of you know whatever the, this this whole riot they got. So you got to have something like that in there just to make it interesting. Really silly. One hundred percent. More words that you don't understand in there, the fancier the dishes. Exactly. And then you can charge $2,000 for it, but we all know it's really, it's just seven tomatoes, a bit of chili, and you kind of, you kind of shave this tiny bit of something else in there, but you know, it's not false. It's not false advertising. Slightly misleading yep. at best, you know? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> talking about, um, talking about making money, uh, I've, I found it this interesting. We talked about the, the hate from other people online. What I find interesting is this challenge between I was I was I was standing up for um, Mick from uh, Turf and Surf or Surf and Turf, can't remember which way around it is, because he was talking about uh, somebody commented on his thing saying, "Stop doing all these paid sponsored posts, um, it's ruining yep. the page," and I was like, oh, it, it frustrates me when people say that because 
I know how much work and effort, well, not specifically, but I get a really good idea of how much work and effort goes into making an Instagram page and, and, and following up on the content and putting effort into content. And when I see someone who's, do, who's got a sponsored post and I've seen that you've, kind of, you've done you know, a few over the years, I kind of feel like really celebratory for the person. I'm like, man, fantastic. Look at, look at this. Like there's somebody who you're not, you're not Jason Hodges. You're not the guys on better homes and gardens. You're just a guy out his garden. And look, a brand's wanting to support that. I think that's really, really cool. And yet you get some people who are like, nah, stuff you. It's like, man, it's it's an interesting thing. How do you feel about it all? Like you're saying you're lucky that you haven't had that hate yet, but it's a, yeah. It's a strange world that people who would follow you and then shoot you down when you start getting some success. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly weird. And um, I've done a few sponsored posts over the time, but I mean, generally it's products that I have purchased before or I've used. Um, and I'm probably not one that's going to reach out to a brand um, and ask for something for free. But, um, you know, the guys that we've worked with, and if I can mention names, you know, Subpot. Well, I, I did purchase one and then we got another one and that was really cool. Um, and I, I think probably the, I don't even know if it's the, the content, it's certainly not, not great. Um, obviously some people like it and I think that genuineness maybe is where I haven't got some of that, that hate mail or the, the push, um, product push, if that makes sense. I, I don't try to push it too hard. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I just, I really don't understand it why some people will follow you, but then hate you for it. Yeah, I, I, my personal opinion is like if you're gonna put that much effort in, it's the, it's the, it's the sponsored posts that pay for the free posts, because you know, like people like Mick or, or um, you know, most 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 people who are doing lawn stuff online, they probably have kids, married you know, hobbies and you kind of sacrificing that stuff to make the content. And when someone's like, Oh, don't make money from it. So, well, why would I make the content? You know, like I may as well just spend another hour at work, get some overtime and spend time with my family. Yeah. You know, like what am I doing all this work for? It's interesting, interesting challenge. Yeah. I mean, you know, some really good things. You come home from work and you might, you know, put your feet up or you have a cup up for, 20 minutes or so and you know you're flicking through stuff and you know the guys like tim or there's a really cool account the melbourne lawn i love watching his stuff um he's got a ripping lawn at the moment but you kind of look at it and well they probably wouldn't make some of this stuff for you to engage in and you know just lose yourself in for 10 or 15 minutes um so yeah yeah it's entertainment yeah, it's it's entertainment. Yeah. It's it's a bit weird because if you made a twenty minute show, people would be like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, you can be sponsored. That's fine. Twenty minutes, that's a lot of work." But you're part of yeah. that. You you know, you're talking about you're sitting down and relaxing for twenty minutes. So your your reels and a couple of posts, you're a part of that entertainment. But there's seventeen, fifteen, thirty five other creators on a on a platform like TikTok or Instagram who are taking on that twenty minutes of time. So you're kind of looking at them all. So it kind of doesn't feel, I don't know, I'm making this up as I'm going, but I don't know, it kind of feels like that's, like you haven't done any work because it's only a minute long. Yeah, but you, yeah. I do a minute every second day. You know, it's, you know, it's the same amount of work as doing 20 minutes once a fortnight or something like that. Kind of, yeah. kind of making this up as I go, working it out. <laughs> that's, it's something I think about because obviously we've got sponsors, and um, the amount of effort, we've talked about this on the podcast before as well. Like it takes hours and hours and hours to do a podcast because it's editing yeah. and organizing and obviously the recording time. And and yeah, like people, I don't understand the people who will be like, I want to listen to you, but I hate the ads. Just just skip the ads, you know. People yeah. people don't say negative things about us with the ads. Not that I've heard, not that I've seen, but anyways so back to the tips back to get off the instagram stuff back to your tips so <clears throat> you're having success there's a few things that are, that are hits has anything surprised you that um you thought was going to be something that specifically you thought was really going to stink and you tried it anyway and you're like man this really works here um 
I mean, probably cucumbers. I know they're probably another thing that's easier to grow, but um, with the humidity, we've always struggled with kind of the, the powdery mildew and um, disease side of things. Um, every year I've thought, oh, this will probably struggle this year because it started off really slow and, you know, the first few leaves, they get a bit diseased and damaged and then all of a sudden they just explode. Um, I mean, I've got an archway between two of my, my garden beds at the moment and, you know, it's kind of three quarters full um, of the zucchini vine. You know, it's just loaded with fruit. Um, and I thought for, you know, probably six weeks or so, this is going nowhere. I may as well just rip it out. So that's probably surprised me in terms of the, the ability for it to grow and produce. Um, probably time is the uh, the thing that surprised me the most in flavor and how frequently right. I use it. Um, simple plant to grow. I mean, I do not look at after it at all. Hardly water it. Um, certainly don't fertilize it at all. But I'm out there every day picking it. We put it in our stir fries and in our meat dishes and pastas and everything that we make. So that's been, yeah, a good surprise in terms of what I've used and the taste of it. Something that I didn't think I'd use as much. Have you ever done the maths on whether or not you're actually making or saving money from growing your own food? Because I know some people, I think over a long period of time, you might make a lot of money back. But, you know, some people, they're buying so many different products or so many different raised garden beds and all that kind of stuff that maybe it would have been cheaper in the short term at least to to just go to the shop oh mate i'll tell you right now it's absolutely cheaper to go to the shops um you know to to grow some of the stuff you pay hundreds of dollars in soil you pay hundreds of dollars in um you know raised garden beds or timber for them and then you know the water that you do the fertilizers if you use them um it's not cheap, but I think, you know, the reward is beyond financial. I mean, it's probably cliche to say it tastes better. It certainly does. Um, I will never, ever eat a store-bought tomato again. Mm -hmm. um, they just taste like flour. Um, water. Crunchy water. There's a bit of texture on yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I think that there's bounds of enjoyment that I get out of it. So it's a lot more than financial. Um, would I ever crunch the numbers? Probably not because my wife would kill me. <laughs> yeah, true. true. <laughs> but um, yeah. Well, it's probably a cheaper hobby than golf, I would say, or motorbikes or something else like that. So if you put it that way, overall, you, if, you, if your hobby was golf and you were still going and buying food, you're better off having your hobby be growing food. I, I wonder what, what could you do if you were, let's say, um, to go down the path similar to what um, Brendan and Caitlin from Little Big Farm went down, because I know it is possible. I just know that in a small scale, a lot of us who are hobbyists in it, just true hobbyists, we're doing it for the fun of it. The financial stuff doesn't yeah. come into to thought. But what would you do specifically in your garden, say this coming year, you hit some financial troubles for whatever reason, or you just wanted to, to do it as an experiment and you were like, I'm going to make as much saving from this as possible, what would you be growing? Would you change the way you're doing it? Because this would be an interesting conversation for those who have no experience, who are genuinely wanting to do it for the financial side. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I grow a lot of things that I eat quite regularly, um, but I also do grow some weird things like we've discussed. I mean, um, even, even chilies, for an instance, I've got four or five chili bushes at the moment. Um, I don't think that's a food that would fill you up. It, you know, it certainly complements other meals, but it's something that you're not going to eat a, a super spicy chili times 10 or whatever to fill you up. Um, so the first thing that I'd probably say is list down what do you actually eat quite often um, and grow that as a start. Um, look at things that have got quite big harvest. Like we've spoken plenty of times about how prolific tomato plants are and zucchinis, you know, they just don't stop. Um, you know, even uh, like shooting shooting broccoli, broccolini, um, in winter, that's fantastic. I think, you know, I've planted 50-odd heads of broccoli and cauliflower and that lasted us the entire winter and we probably had one or two each night with dinner. Um, so there's certainly a financial saving there, but, yeah, you, you probably do have to sacrifice space, especially in a small space for weird and wonderful things. I think a lot of people are getting their own seeds. If you go on the cheaper side as well, because it's one of the things like a lot of us will just go and buy seedlings 
which are, you know, they're not expensive. Um, but if you buy seeds, it's cheaper. And if you got your own seeds from your own harvest, that's free. And obviously, yeah. like seedlings are a few dollars here and there. But if you're buying a lot of them over the course of the season, it will it would add up. And that's maybe another thing that people could do. Yeah, well, I remember the first time that I, or the first year that we really started our garden, I think I went down to the local nursery and it was, you know, over $100 on a few tomato plants and bits and pieces. And, oh, geez, this is a bit scary. Um, and then, you know, the next season we, we grew everything from seed and it was certainly a lot better. And then, you know, once that season happened, we made sure to get a few heirloom varieties and, you know, tomatoes, you squash a few in a bit of um, paper towel. And you got hundreds of different plants, you know, more than I can physically plant out. Um, every year we let a few oh, of yeah. the, you know, broccolis and collies go to uh, go to flower and harvest the seeds there. And, you know, that's been really good. Um, and I think as well, if you cherry pick the things that have done well, they should consistently do well over time. Have you ever done mushrooms yourself? Have you grown them? No, I'm actually not a big fan of mushrooms. Um, I'll eat them, but yeah, I'd love to try it one day. Um, my wife loves them, but I don't know, it kind of scares me a little bit. Down in um, Victoria, there was a bit of an interest poisonous mushrooms. Um, and yeah, I just haven't been game, haven't been game to try it. No. Hold on a second, mate. I'm going gonna... to... Yeah, so there's that lady who who did the dodgy with the mushrooms. So, I mean, that's one... That's a great way to blow up. You know how you say people don't... They're not giving you much hate. If you were down that path, they'd be giving you a little bit of hate, I reckon. At least just a little bit. Yeah. I mean, look, that's probably just a fear of mine that I, I do need to grow up and overcome. But, um, yeah, look, probably one day I will give it a Um, what fruit trees have you considered getting? Do, do you have any fruit trees specifically? I don't remember if you do. I do. So um, the orange trees were probably my first ones that we had at this house. Um, but I've been growing fruit trees since I was a you know a young lad. Um, we had quite a big uh, fruit tree orchard at my parents' house. Um, but you know, here at home, I've got oranges. You know, everybody's got a lemon tree. Um, I've got a a grafted apple tree. So we've got three different varieties of apples on the one one tree there. Um, figs, yeah, quite a number of different citruses. So I would love to expand it, but again, space is starting to become the issue with everything. Where do I plant it? Um, I've considered many times putting it in the back lawn, but I do just enjoy the lawn too much at this stage. This is... This is the problem I'm telling you, mate. You're going to go down this path. And next minute, you like I said, you're going to have acres. You'll have multiple animals. Kill your children. Yeah, you know, you'll be cooking your own sourdough bread from scratch. Nothing gets bought at the shop anymore. You have your own sheep. You know, like it's it's addictive, isn't it? Like you, it's you've uh, you're like oh, I'd like a few more fruit trees. Oh, okay, I'll get a little bit extra space. Oh, I... so you you'll end up growing your own wheat <laughs> for your own pasta. You know what I mean? Yep. Oh, look, I mean, the dream is one day um, when house prices do settle down a bit, if that ever happens, um, we'll buy a, a mini farm. I mean, one of the hobbies that my wife has, she's got horses. Um, and we're lucky enough that there's an adjustment a couple of uh, minutes up the road. But, you know, one day we'll have that, that micro farm and certainly plan out a lot more. Well, I've considered this, in, this interesting thought is is that, uh, you know, a lot of the value in land is just simply how close it is to, to areas we work, city centers, things like that, right? And if you're making your money remotely, you could go to a very, re what you might call a remote area and be able to make an income and live off the land. And I was thinking about that from a mathematical standpoint. If you could get a job, Maybe someone listening to this might be already trying to go down this path where you get a job that, let's say, hypothetically is, say, half the pay, but you live completely off the land and, let's say, you're working half time. 
And so you spend half your time growing your own food, making your own stuff, maybe putting out some online content, getting some some resources through that. Could you make enough money just to tick by? Because a lot of people, I've got a friend from school, um, different friend, not the one who asked me the question about long, um, but they kind he's kind of doing that thing, <clears throat> that going down that path. And I, I think it's an interesting it's an interesting thought experiment because I think a lot of us get stuck in that rat race. And uh, are just doing it because that's what we thought was good. But you're like, hey, house prices are crazy. Well, only if you try and live in the city. Do you really want to live in the city? Yeah, maybe you could go to a country town for the same price as like a as a bloody apartment in the city. You could get quite yeah. a few acres, you know, like and a normal house, and you could have some sheep if you wanted to, you know. <laughs> oh, look, we've certainly considered it. Um, where we live, it's it's not really a city; it's more coastal. Um, we love, you know, we, we grew up basically five minutes away from where we live. So it's a nice part of the world. Um, but, you know, I mentioned I work in transport and one of the depots that we do have is in that really regional part of Victoria. Um, and actually one of my friends moved up there probably five or six years ago um, and they bought 30-something acres of land out at Tongala. Now, for, for those who don't know Tongala, it's quite a, a farming or farm-centric region. Um, so 30 acres isn't a lot, but, you know, they paid half of what we paid for our house here. Um, so it's certainly achievable from a financial perspective and you can probably sacrifice pay to get there. But I think, um, you know, you, you do have other trade-offs with family and friends and moving in that instance. Yeah, all you need is no friends. That's the only thing. You have no family, no friends. It's easy, easy choice. You know what I mean? Yep. It's you and the dog. <laughs> well, the dogs, both dogs in your scenario. Now, it's just, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing because the more jobs become online, obviously a lot of people who listen to this work with their hands and so it's not an option. But yeah, I wonder if you could take, say you're earning a hundred grand a year, but you can move out to the city and live off 70. That, you know, hmm, could I, could I take a job out in the country town for 70 grand a year? And would I enjoy that more, you know? And and I feel like people like in our age bracket, you know, my kids are, one's coming up to three soon and one's kind of one and a half. Um, before their school age, it's, once you get into school, it's a difficult choice. But, you know, it's it's a, it's an option. It's, you know, it is something that's, that's crossed our mind for sure because, um, yeah, there's all sorts of things that we've been thinking about and just having that passion and love for all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But yeah. One one of the things that I'm thinking of, of challenging myself with with this banana plant is is trying to grow uh with artificial light, grow some veggies and stuff in here in the warehouse. I'm gonna contact some of these um people that do the like the the benches. Not the benches, what do they call them? Shelves. Like the grow, grow light shelves, I think they are. Yes, yeah, the grow light shelves. The um, I want to try and see if I can actually grow food that tastes good off them because I'm sure I can grow something off them because I do have artificial lights in here in different spots. But I reckon that yeah. would be an interesting experiment too because, yeah, I mean, I've only ever done ornamental plants in here to make it look like a bit like a jungle. But, yeah, I mean, herbs for sure. You could definitely grow some herbs in here because some of them do really well in shade. But plants that flower yeah. and fruit, that's the one I'm like, hmm. That'll be that'll be an interesting challenge. One of the cool things um, that you see at Bunnings every now and then is the um, oh, it's like a, a little pot with the grow light on top, and you know the advertisement there is you can grow you know a micro tomato. I'd love to try that out one day, but it's certainly something that we've considered here. Um, in the winter months, I bought just a little cheap grow light set to start the seedlings off. Um, they successfully worked, um, but yeah, it's certainly something that I'd love to go full scale with one day. Um, if we get the opportunity, even like the micro herbs, uh, there's plenty of yeah. cool YouTube channels on that. Um, which again, oh, finding the cool. time and space for it, but certainly worth an experiment if that's what you're into. There's a lot of hydroponic stuff that people do, and yeah, there's a lot of really interesting things. But yeah, I reckon, yeah, if I could make like a like a vertical garden behind me. That was, and I've actually thought about putting spinach on this vertical wall and then just eating 
like just pulling it off for a sandwich at lunchtime or something. Cause there's a little kitchenette over there in the corner people, um, like with the fridge and, you know, a, a sandwich toaster and a microwave and the very, the very basics. But yeah, I've, I've thought about that and then I'm spending a lot more time in here. I've kind of brought my office into, into here and I was like, yeah, it's just a, it's an interesting thing, but it's kind of like the exact opposite of going out to the rural area to the, to a farm. It's like how urban can you make growing food, you know, in the middle yeah. of a warehouse? Can you, can you make it work? Yep. Oh, look, and there's lots of urban gardeners, um, that, you know, they're very successful. Um, some of my favorite YouTube channels are the, you know, people have probably heard of Epic Gardening and, um, his early stuff, he was in a tiny little inner city apartment and he just grew phenomenal amounts of food. Um, Again, I'm torn because I, I do enjoy a, a nice lawn and a space for the dogs to run around in, but um, it's certainly doable if you put your mind to it. Who is your, who's your gardening hero if you're going to put somebody on that tier? I do like Mark from Self Sufficient Me. Um, he's probably... I probably watched every one of his YouTube videos during COVID, um, the first few weeks when we were locked down. Um, yeah, pr- probably him. He He's just a guy that gets in, gets stuff done, doesn't really care what it looks like, um, grows some really cool stuff, experiments as well. And I've probably taken a bit of that um, experimental focus um, that he does into my gardening. But yeah, there's plenty of good ones. Um, I mentioned Epic Gardening is really cool. Um, there's lots of really cool people on Instagram. Um, you know, the Urban Farmer, he's one that I've been really following recently. Um, you just build a greenhouse and just really cool stuff like that. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, Mark, Mark is a real human too. You know, like, not that I've um, had much interaction with him. He has said yes to coming on the podcast at some stage. So that'll be a great episode when that happens. Um, yeah, but absolutely. yeah, like he's, he's not one of these people who comes across as bought and sold by a brand or smarter than you, more experienced than you, whatever, you know, it's just like, this is a human being who loves his gardens and he's just telling you about his journey. Yep. Yeah. I guess that's probably that connection factor that we spoke about before. That's really what got me into it. Um, you know, a lot of the the garden people are from overseas and I find that um, you can engage with them, but you can't mm. really relate with your environment. So, you know, the, the people that do share that stuff in, within, you know, Australia, um, yeah, I don't know, it, it might be biased, but I can just relate to it a little bit more as well. Well, that's the whole reason why we want to start this podcast, you know, it's getting close to a year now, well. 10 months or whatever it is, but yeah, the, the, the whole, the, it's getting better and better, but the, especially on YouTube, there wasn't really that much content and it, like, Mark was the outlier, you know, and there's others out there for, for, for growing food and stuff, but the compared to the amount of European or specifically American content, you know, yeah. another one that's, that's good is, is do you watch much of the Kiwi grower? I mean, he's not Australian, but you've never seen his stuff. No, I haven't. No, I've, you got to get onto him. He's great. Yeah, I, I look. I mean, there's plenty out there that I've never heard of. Um, but I think YouTube, YouTube's algorithm is good. I've just got to spend the time looking at these guys because they certainly do give you some really good ideas and tips to bring into your own garden. Yeah, I, I've, I don't know the Kiwi gardener's name off the top of my head, but he's um, he's someone I do want to have on. Uh, at the right stage, but I, I got, I found him because he grew tomato and potato where he grafted a tomato onto a potato and grew them at the same yeah. time and had, uh, and ate, ate a meal that included both the tomatoes and the potato from the same, from the same plant. And so yeah. I was like, wow, that's cool. And he's, he's another one of these guys who, he, who, um, is a, not that I've met him or even interacted with him online, but it seems like a real human being who just happens to be interested in the YouTube side of things and so sort of gets into it. You know what I mean? Like he's not, doesn't feel fake. It doesn't feel like he's trying to sell you something, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly get that. Yeah. I'll, I'll have to check him out. I, I feel, 
I feel like with this with um some of the uh it's interesting watching TV again after watching so much YouTube and cuz cuz I don't I basically don't watch TV other than sport and the amount of ads and the amount of like um I don't want to have a crack at anybody like like a Charlie Alburn or anything cuz I think from what I've heard of Charlie's a fantastic guy but I think the medium like the TV medium is uh, you, you've got a time slot. You've got to try and fit it in. And you're trying to make it something for an audience that's really broad. So it'd be people like you and I in our age bracket and then people in their 70s, people who want to grow food, people who couldn't care less about growing food, people who want an amazing lawn, and then seven different varieties of effort they want to put in all the way from my, I'm going to buy a $10,000 mow master and <laughs> cut it every 15 minutes to like I only want to cut it once a once a year, kind of, you know, like it's very yeah. difficult in six minutes to do a program that that covers all those bases, and their camera presence and stuff is professional, which is good. But it's interesting to then juxtapose that to Mark or somebody else, like a Ben Sims, even with lawn tips, and just be like, yeah. "This is just a guy talking to a camera about a really niche thing." That you wouldn't think that many people would be interested in, but here, there's here we are, four hundred thousand of us watching it. And it's just such an interest. It's such an interesting thing, the online world and and the weird, the weird types of questions that people try and answer. That that you know, like it's it's interesting, it's entertaining, but you would have never done that on Better Homes and Gardens back in the day. Just not enough people interested, you know. Yeah, and look, I think that um that kind of medium there is definitely a, a shift. Um, I know the, the way that things are changing, but going back to the monetization thing that you mentioned before, I think it's allowed people to kind of offer that that side of it. Um, you know, people are probably not giving up their day jobs, but um, it certainly allows that content to be made, which can be a bit more niche and specific to the different audiences. Um, I mean, I, I don't watch a lot of TV myself, but probably the bit that turns me off is that quick six minute clip in between ads and, I love that long form stuff that, you know, Ben and Mark and all the different people do um, for, yeah, watching stuff that I enjoy. Yeah. Like a half an hour video, I get I almost get excited. If someone usually does a 15 minute video and then they're releasing a half an hour long. You're like, oh, they had some trouble with this. You know, like it was more challenging than they expected. Oh, this is a really in depth look into something. I'm really going to learn something here, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah i mean probably the um the the best videos that i watched on the lawn side was definitely one of simsy's um renovations and i probably came into that side of it extremely naive when we bought the house and it was google how do i do a lawn renovation what equipment do i need um but that education like that's allowed me to transform basically a dust bowl to something that actually grows grass so the, the benefit's certainly there and yeah it's enjoyable at the same time to watch Well, that's one of the things I want to do this year is um, because I started the podcast because I couldn't find the, there were, there were good podcasts, but there weren't podcasts that were doing exactly the type of content I wanted to do. Um, And so I was like, that's it. I want to do my own podcast. And I realized as well, there's also YouTube, there's YouTube videos that people don't do. And I don't know if you know this, but I write articles for my website and, um, I actually get more reads on my articles than I do listens on the podcast, but the articles are kind of anonymous. They're not my name's at the top of them, but people are just looking for an answer. So I've got this series of articles I've written over the last few years called everything you need to know about fill in the blank, like a plant. So Mariah or lily pilly or kangaroo paws or <clears throat> whatever. Right. And I think I've got about 15 of those that I've written. And then I've got a bunch of other ones like, um, you know, everything you need to know about fertilizing. Oh no, yeah, like things like that, like lawns and this and that, whatever. And um, I get like fifteen to twenty thousand hits a month on these articles. And it just recently clicked to me. I was like, I wrote those articles kind of as a both because there was no one else writing it, and also because I wanted to hone my own skills in that area. And learn stuff myself and treat it like kind of like an essay at school. You know what I mean? Like 
you want to try and learn some stuff and maybe I know a bunch about this, but I'm going to do a lot, bunch of research and for my own education, challenge myself, learn something, put it out in the, in the internet. I was like, why don't I just make those into videos? Because there's nobody out there being like, here's a 30 minute video on Mariah Hedges. Because it's like, it's such a weird niche thing. I've already written the article. But anyways, I'm going to be doing some of that this year. And I don't know, five people might watch it or whatever, you know, but you might get some traction. Great if you do, but it's kind of, yeah, you know, it's, 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 it, it's cool that there's that incentive to make the weird stuff that probably wouldn't have had success a couple of years ago, even, you know, but now it's this whole niche. People love it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, going to your point with people watching, I think if you've kind of asked that question yourself, um, there's probably chances are more people going to ask that question. Um, obviously not everyone's got the courage, me included to, um, you know, create videos and put their face, um, and voice on the internet for that long. Um, something I'd love to do, but just not very good at it. But, um, people I think will have those same questions. And when people don't have the courage to kind of create that content, it does leave that gap. Well, I wonder, mate, if you, because I felt the same way when I first went on camera, but I was doing stuff. I got lucky. I was doing stuff for charity. We told you before about that cycle we did around the country. Um, yep. That forced us um, when I was, I was 19 when we did that. And um, to promote it, we went on radio stations, a lot of country radio stations. You go through Victoria, whatever, blah, blah. And you go in the country ABC stuff and you get the interview and you talk about this and you kind of get comfortable with the sound of your own voice because it is weird to hear yourself and you'd be like, do I sound like that? You know? And then, yeah, being interviewed and we did do a couple of TV interviews. Um, <clears throat> again, mostly country town, seven win or gem or whatever, not gem. What do they call the, uh, anyway, you get the idea. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Those country town ones. And then, over time, we did more and more things. And before I even did the podcast, many years ago, 2018, I think we did a, a – it was 2018. We did a cycling adventure through Tanzania. And we cycled through Tanzania and climbed Mount Kilimanjaro for charity. And I was a cyclist in this one. We made a video that went semi-viral for us. It got tens of thousands of watches. And uh, a news show in America called Right This Minute – found us and this was like a daytime tv show in arizona and they were like would you like to come on and we were like yeah so like 1 a.m in the morning me and my mate jordan uh doing a, a video interview for this american tv show and it's funny because it's like it was the least pressure i'd ever felt in my life because no one i knew was going to watch it you know you could be whoever you wanted to be but <clears throat> i look back on stuff like that and i'm like it's so cringe it is so bad back in the day the stuff that you're doing. I watched the Ben Sims video uh, early on. <laughs> like if you go back and watch his stuff, it is cringe. It's embarrassing, but you do it for long enough and you finally get comfortable in front of the camera and stuff. So I wonder if you would be the same, you know, if you started making some YouTube videos and, you know, a couple of hundred people watch it here or there, all of a sudden thousands, you, get, you start getting some traction. All of a sudden, mate, you make some money. You get your, you, here we go. This is how you get your land. You get your land. You're making your money off content online. Next minute, the chickens, the sheep, the 40 acres, you know, you've got, you've grown everything, you know. I'm just making your life plan for you now. <laughs> I reckon I'll have to hire you as a bit of a uh, life coach, I think they call it. I'll, I'll charge you in tomatoes, all right? <laughs> whatever excess you've got yeah, but, we'll yeah you, you get the idea that All i'm right. trying to get though i i think yeah i think i think there's just this um yeah we all get scared about jumping on camera to start with but there's potential and, and you're gonna be you're gonna suck at everything if when the first time you do it you know nothing unless you're just an absolute raw talent and very few of us are that so yeah, that's all right yeah mate All right, cool so other than other than starting the uh, the next YouTube channel that's going to challenge self sufficient me, what else are your plans for twenty twenty four? Oh look, mate, uh, I'm going back to school, so I think probably the um, 
the time in the garden might be a little bit less than I'd, I'd like to hope, but um, I, I really, really want to get the, the, I call it the other side of my lawn um, fixed up. That's still got quite a bit of damage from where we dug out some um, extra space for the gardens and whatnot. So that's probably going to be a bit of a challenge over winter. Um, certainly going to get an oversow on. Um, we've struggled the past couple of years during winter to keep those stripes up. So that will be the first time I do a right over so. Um, but, yeah, I mean, just probably keep doing doing what we're doing and see how we go with it. Probably haven't really thought about exactly what we want to grow yet. Um, we'll get this season over and then, yeah, figure out what we're going to plan for winter. But I suspect it'll be a lot of the, the brassica type plants. Well, mate, we're at an hour and a half. And um, I'll, tell me what you're doing for school. Um, we'll, we'll start wrapping this up, but it sounds like, are you, are you, um, are you making a whole career change? Are you just, are you learning interpretive dance routines, you know, something like that? Yeah, look, that'd be nice. No, um, I'm going back to do a master's degree. So, um, I work in obviously logistics. Part of my role is, um, on business strategy and bits and pieces. So yeah, going to, going to learn how to play with the big boys. Depending. The big boys. Do you know what? Like, I th- I reckon if you if you ever feel in, you ever feel a little bit, um, yeah, you, know, you end him going to a new place, and you feel a little bit out of what's what's the word insecure. You know what I mean? I reckon you should just go back. You, you at least can lean back on, yeah. But have you grown blue watermelon banana squashes? Everyone's going to say no, and you can just look at dead in the eye and go, well, shut up then, all right? <laughs> I reckon that's one I'll have to keep up my back pocket. Exactly, right? And it'll be the weirdest. It's like a Seinfeld sketch. They'll be, what the heck is going on? No one knows what's going on, but you can just go, yeah, I might be the most inexperienced person in this room, but have you grown a blue? Is, is that even what they're called? Blue Guatemalan banana Bananas. squash? I reckon it was. I'll just be known as that weird, weird veggie guy in the corner. That's it. Well, mate, anyways, before we um, head off, what should we, what can we do to find you on the interwebs? Yeah, and so what can we head to uh, Instagram and uh, search Cam's Lawn and Garden or Organic Garden Patch as the handle. Um, drop me a comment if, if you need anything or hit me up in the messages and we'll have, we'll have a chat. Sounds awesome, mate. I really appreciated you having you on. And uh, we should stay in touch after this. Let me know how you're a blue watermelon squash banana, whatever it's called, goes. If it actually tastes any good. And uh, make sure to get that glass gem corn just for the Instagram photos. Whenever when everything's got a little bit dry, you want to get a few extra followers, chuck that one on there, mate. Absolutely. I'll, uh, I'll make sure to tag you in it. Thanks, mate. My neighbours sound like they're doing burnout, so it's definitely time to go. Thank you so much for coming on. And everybody, we'll see you in the next podcast.